I want to welcome today to the Unimpressed podcast, Alfonso Deanda. And we're unimpressed that we haven't started working with him until now. Alfonso has just hooked up with us on the social media cycle with Tyler and our company, and we're excited about that. And we're a little unimpressed it didn't happen before now. And welcome, Alfonso. Thank you so much, John. I'm very excited to start working with you guys and uh, looking forward to do great things. You know, what's your go-to passion? What has driven you to put you in this place of entertainment today? I love talking to people. I just love to give messages and, and, and empower ideas. And uh, since I was very young, it really it was it was my focus that I really wanted to work in areas where I, I could be close to people and, 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 and to send those messages that could make things better. Sometimes, sometimes not, because that's the way our business works. But at the end, my passion was talking to people, communicating, generating messages, content. That's my passion. What would you say your overall uh, message is? We just have one life and whatever we do, we better be sure what we're doing and we better do it the right way. So we really have to enjoy every single moment that we have in life. And as long as we do that, we're going to be okay. Problems start when you start overthinking about things that passed a few years ago or yesterday or whenever you, you, you want to say it. Or when you're always thinking about what you're going to be doing tomorrow, what are you doing today in life? And that's what's going to make you happy. I hear you. I like that. That's kind of my mindset. I say every day is a new day. I forgot yeah. what I did yesterday. And I really, I take that approach every day. Whatever I've accomplished or whatever, I'm still think I'm that piece of shit upstairs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to go. You're doing it the right way. So we're in the same path. Yeah, man. The most important thing about life is what? The most important thing in life is family. I take it a little deeper than that. I say the most important thing about life is life. Because if you don't have life, what else you got? You know? That's true. I, I totally agree. That's the way it happens. I mean, when, when, you're not, when you're not living, you cannot enjoy what I was mentioning. Family. Family is part of life. So you're, you're totally right. Yeah. And if you don't have that life, you don't need to and get to enjoy those things with family and so forth. And speaking of family, being from... Mexico City. Is that where your wife's from or is she American? Uh, my family, including my wife, we're a mix of a lot of places. But uh, my wife is from Colombia. She was born in uh, Medellin in Colombia. Actually, I met her when we just when I just got to Miami. I was ready to go party in South Beach and all this lifestyle that Miami has. And after two weeks, I met her. We fell in love. And here I am. <laughs> Well, if she's from Colombia, I would imagine she's very, very beautiful. Oh, she's those, gorgeous. Because <laughs> those, those women down there, you, you're probably like, whoops. Okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> it's over. Let, let's just say I'm very happy. She's a good woman, and, and she's very beautiful. Now, were you, were you a club guy down there? Did you go to any clubs back in the day? Oh, that was a long time ago. But, yeah, I used to go a lot. I used to live in South Beach when I, when I got to Miami. And uh, I used to go to a lot of places. I don't even remember the names. There was this place called Space. I don't know if it still exists. That mm -hmm. it used to open at 11 o'clock p.m. And, and, and you used to get out of there at like 9, 10 a.m. in the morning. It was like for a hardcore party. <laughs> you know, when you get up with the family, you know, what is your day like? What do you run through on a daily basis? Before COVID or after COVID? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about before COVID and then what has changed since COVID. The TV gig that I have as a host, I might be traveling. I might be waking up in a different city, staying all day in a studio, shooting just the show I'm, I'm, I'm working on. If that's not the case, before COVID, I used to go to my office. I used to have a production company. We were creating a lot of content for Latin America. We were working for a lot of networks doing uh, short formats, a lot of brand integration products for them. After COVID, everything changed. Uh, we decided it was time to close the company. And then I started doing all this uh, social media content at my office here home. I mounted my own studio. I started developing my own content for my social media platforms. It worked. I loved it because I was able to do what I really like to do. And now I, I realize that I can do both things. When things start getting to normal, then I'm going to be able to go do both worlds. So I'm enjoying my life, getting up early, taking my kids to school. Life is lower. I, I take things with more calm. So um, I really enjoy it. 
I work on my content. I do a lot of research of what I'm going to be talking about, the content I'm going to be posting. I still have my meetings with my clients that they still need some stuff that goes more digitally oriented for their networks, which we Mm -hmm. do a lot of that stuff. Then I pick up my kids at school, which I love to do that. And I was not able to do it before. I spend most of the time here home. Before breaking my leg, I used to run every morning. Uh, I love running. I do a lot of marathons and races. Pretty much, that's my life. How'd you break your leg? I, wa- I went to North Carolina for Christmas. And we were staying at a place called uh, Lake Gaston. I don't know if you know it. You're familiar with it. That's up north in North Carolina. It's a very quiet place. We wanted to stay somewhere where, somewhere where uh, we could just be in the cold weather, getting out from Miami, enjoying uh, some time with family, really close family. I was doing a barbecue. I went down to get the, the, light, the lighter to turn on the barbecue and there was a hill and I just lived in the most ridiculous way. And I was not wearing boots, which wow. when you're in a cold weather, that's what you have to do. Now I know I have, that's, that's what you have to do. So you I didn't have, you didn't have on moccasins. You're in the mountains. out on some moccasins or something. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> not that extreme, but I was wearing just sneakers. It just happened. And my doctor was like, and where were your boots? Yeah. Well, I was not wearing my boots. Well, that's why this happened. And now I have my, my, my broken ankle and I have to wait two more months to start running again. To set this up, what Alfonso has done. I mean, he's, he's done a lot of big things. You, you work the red carpet, the billboard Latin music yeah. awards. Yeah. The billboard Latin music awards. That was uh, for Telemundo. I did it for five years. Now you did the L factor X, uh, the X factor uh, for Latin yeah. America. And for the U.S. Yeah. Hispanic uh, market. Well, you were the, hosted the first season there, right? Yeah, yeah correct. And then you did, um, was this TV Azteca in Mexico? I worked for TV Azteca, yeah, the morning show for uh, TV Azteca, which is um, one of the two major networks in Mexico. And um, I did that for three years. I used to travel every week doing that show. Uh, I used to be in Mexico Monday through Friday, and every Friday flying back to Miami to be with my family. That was that was something I wouldn't do ever again in my life. I love the show, really? but traveling every week, I hated it. You've interviewed uh, Shakira, Ricky yeah. Martin, Gloria Estefan, Enrique Iglesias, Antonio Banderas, Tom Hanks, Robert De Niro, Metallica, just to name a few. Who was the most interesting out of that group? Tom Hanks was amazing. He's a really cool guy. He's down on earth. Uh, he's very relaxed. He was willing to do whatever I asked him to do because he went to my show. And uh, we cooked and uh, he tried the hot peppers and he was not afraid to do it. It was fun. We just had a lot. It was a good time. And and, and he was very open. No diva thing of like, I'm a huge celebrity. Don't touch me. Don't No, He was like real. And sometimes nice. that doesn't happen. So it was really cool to, to spend some time with him. I usually don't talk a lot about on this podcast. I try to dig into people's lives and figure out how they live and what they're about spirituality, you know, everyday things, seeing these big names is kind of a setup for, you know, you're, you have a business pre COVID you transition to this new business through COVID you've had all this experience and then you're going through this transition with this pandemic. What does that do to your psyche? You want to tell you a a real transition I got in my life at some point that was 2012 I was the main host for Univision um, Despierta America, which is the equivalent of uh, Good Morning America. I was doing great. And uh, from one day to another, I had an accident in my back. Uh, I had to retire from my job. They fired me because uh, they didn't believe I was sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did that the same day I let them know I had to take the surgery because if not, I was not going to walk again. And uh, because of the contract that I had with uh, the company at that time, there was no way I could bring lawyers in or anything because there was a clause that allowed them to do that. When that happened, I remember the next day I was flying to Mexico City because my doctor was based in Mexico. He's my godfather. And he was a person I trusted to do and perform this surgery. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember when I was going into the surgery room, he was right there. And I was just thinking that I had lost everything in life. He came to me and then he said, you know, there's a lot of people that love you. I'm one of those. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to perform this surgery as if you were my son. And that's when I realized 
that the most important thing that I had in life was there, which is the people that really cares about me. The rest, it was just getting through that and then start all over again. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it happened. And I was, I was very thankful because my parents took care of me. My wife was there. My kids were there. My best friends were there. People that really cared about me never left. And then I, that was a big lesson for me, a huge mm -hmm. lesson. And then I went back to the business and I started working and, 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 and other stuff happened, which it's a long story. I mean, we could talk for hours and because I could tell you what happened after that. And it's funny because one thing takes you always to another thing. Yeah. I never expected anything. I think if you play by the rules in life, you end up where you're supposed to be. You can still have fun. You can push the envelope a little bit. But I think if you definitely play by the rules, you end up where you're supposed to be. And there's there's divine intervention in that, I believe. I really believe that. Oh, yeah. You believe in God. I, I can tell that. And I do believe in God. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a divine intervention. And, and, and he takes care of you. But there's a huge part that depends on you. If you can make things clear from A to Z, if you can expect failure before it happens and plan for failure before it happens and keep people on the, their heels and stay yeah. ahead of the game, I think you can make your path very, very clear. When, when you're young, you, you don't take those precautions because you, you want to go fast. Yeah. The conversation I had is like, when you keep people on their heels is if you, when you say you set somebody up for failure, It's not like you're trying to be a negative thing, but if you put those decisions on the other person because you do the right thing up front and you itemize those things and say, hey, we're expecting this A, B, C, D, yeah. and they don't follow through with A, B, C, D, then the pressure's on them. It's not on you. Yeah. A lot of people don't dig that deep to position, put themselves in that position. That's true. I think that takes a lot of stress off both sides because if you leave things in the middle, right? and you don't keep people on their heels and make them accountable, it leaves them room to bitch. And then you're bitching because you're pissed off because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. You can make those things very, very clear. That's kind of how I've approached things. I don't know the past 10 years, but before that I didn't have that uh, vision or, you know, idea to, to look that deep into certain situations. Communication is lost in translation. If you will. I, I also think that when you're young, you're afraid of saying the wrong thing or pissing the wrong person. You're very cautious about certain decisions that you're right. You got to make things very straight. But but sometimes you just want to be politically correct. And because uh, I, I remember the, the manager I used to have at that time, he told me like, listen, you don't want to make this a big deal because you want to work again. And I was like, okay, so what should I do? Just stay quiet. I, I call that the vapor. I would kowtow to those personalities in a certain way when I realized I created something with value and I knew they were sending me down the wrong path. I would tell them to go fuck themselves. But, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 yeah. but you know what I mean? I, that's a, but when I was trying to come up in the game, you know, you're like, huh, yes. whatever, <laughs> whatever. And then you realize... You realize all that bowing down is 90% bullshit, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> just like that. Yeah. It's just like that. And, uh, but, but you have to live to understand that because fortunately, John, you have to live things to get to know what you have to do. It, it's only the experience, what, what will teach you. And sometimes you tell this, that we're talking right now to young people. They yeah. don't care. They don't listen. Well, we're in a, we are in the world of pop culture and the nonsense and people feed the beast. They make money from the beast. We had a conversation about some of these people who have these big followings or whatever. If they're going to feed the beast for 20 years, what kind of stamp will they have when they stop? They probably won't have a stamp because they won't nobody will remember because all they did is feed the beast. That's true. That's you you true. know what I'm saying? In, inside of that beast, there's also really good people. And that's kind of the story what happened to me because after my accident, I was disappointed with the business. I didn't yeah. want to work again. I, actually, I, I took a job as a media manager for a company. I was not happy. But mm -hmm. uh, for me, I didn't realize I was not happy. It was just what it meant to me was that I didn't have to deal with all these executives any back, anymore. And that's what I wanted. I didn't want to see any more executive talking bullshit and promising false things. And in the most mysterious way, my agent based in LA called me and told me, listen, there's this guy called John Ferriter, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Mm -mm. John Ferriter was uh, one of the big heads at William Morris Agency. 
And he told me like, okay, John Ferriter is looking for you because he want to produce a, a show uh, and he wants to shoot a pilot. And he used to watch you in Univision and he heard that you're not there anymore. So he wants to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, to me, he was looking for a Latino host because they were developing for NBC a new morning show. Because they were trying to get like more like a, 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 a broader audience, a new audience and bring more Latinos into the U.S. market mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So, so I was like, okay, let's do it. And we shoot that pilot. And I went back to the business because of this guy that was really cool to me. And he said so amazing. I mean, really cool things that, that gave me. And he was like, listen, don't, don't ever lose your path. You're good mm -hmm. at what you do. Don't believe whatever people say, whatever you think people is doing because they want to hear you. You are who you are and you're good on what you're doing. So just keep doing it. And he helped me a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, I didn't used to speak English like now. He got me an accent reduction teacher, an English teacher. And I was in classes for six months. Mm -hmm. And then I went to LA, we shoot the pilot. And it was, it was like Disneyland for me. It was like, and it didn't happen at the end because the executives from NBC at the end, when we were about to start shooting the show and, and go on air, they said that the market was not ready for, for people like me. And, and it didn't happen. At the end, because of that, I went back into business. And then Fox Network called me to do the X Factor. And then I went to TV Azteca. And my career started all over again. But that was the episode that needed to happen in my life for mm -hmm. me to be back into what I, into what was my passion and what I really love to do. I mean, what's your ultimate goals now in the next couple of years? I just realized that I don't need a network to do what I love to do, that I can be my own boss and I can create my own. It's just that like what we're doing right now, John, we don't need a big network to do what we're doing. You just saw what I was doing. I I, I saw what you were doing. I liked what, what you're doing with your business, with Unimpressed, with everything that you're doing. And uh, and I, I was like, okay, my gut feeling tells me that this is the way to go. And with the COVID-19, that's what happened to me. I realized that I didn't need to work for big networks to achieve my goals. Just working hard every day and pursuing my personal dream. And I discovered that that there was a niche. I think it's the Wild West. I mean, I developed a thousand TV shows and I sold three. Done the thing with USA Network and NBC Universal. Uh, yeah. Jeff Tratchell bought a show of ours. I think they spent $750,000 on the pilot. Took a year and a half of my life. And in the final two shows that we picked was our show, All In with Brandon Lang and then The Crizzlies. It was funny. Brandon was a blonde headed guy. Crizzly was a blonde headed guy. And obviously they took the Crizzlies and moved on. But, you know, a year and a half of my time and $750,000, it's like they built a house and they said no. You just got to get used to it. That's how it works. By no means, I, I, I say that that because of what I've been through. But now mm -hmm. I realize that that's not the only option I have, which mm -hmm. I understand. And I see that you totally understand that part too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We kind of did a soft open and we really don't have our content in order yet. But we do have a network up on Roku. We're launching on Apple, uh, Amazon, and Android. Yes, I, I, I see it. I, I, I went to that page and I saw it. It's, and it's really cool. I worked with Tyler four or five years ago when he was at Dipley. Yes. And I built a pretty big network of about 20 million people. And then I brought Tyler in to say, hey, how can we take all these assets and make a bigger reach? So we don't know what the blueprint is, but I think that... We can make money with the network on social yeah. and it can build the content on the other platforms like Roku, Apple, Amazon, and the Android. The eyeballs that we get, and I put my logo on everything, the eyeballs that we get is just as much as NBC, ABC, CBS. There's no difference. That's a way to build empires. I mean, if you want to build a business, if you want to build your dream, that's the way you do it. I'm the type of guy that would go into a meeting, care who it is, I'll drop a grenade at any time. Or if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. I'll give up everything and just roll the dice. And that's how I've always been. And it's worked out, fortunately. I'm excited about the future. Hopefully this turns into what I think it can turn into. But, you know, being famous is eyeballs. If you call it being famous, whatever that is, we have the eyeballs. So how do we finesse that? Yeah, well, you know, for me, the, the part of being famous is just the price. When people recognize you, is because you've done what you had to do. So, but that's not the goal. It's just a reminder that you're doing things the right way and that you have to keep doing them in the same way. But, but if your goal is to be famous, if your goal is to be recognized, it, it's the wrong way. Absolutely. And I, I, I use the word famous. I mean, I guess that's how uh, me and you 
look at it differently, but that's how I think the outside looking in would re- understand what I'm trying to say. Yep. Um, because the eyeballs is visibility yep. and the more people that see that person and who that person is. You're doing it the right way. That's why I'm very happy to, to be part of this project. This is the present, not the future, but this is the way to do things. We can create you. I don't know if you have any content you own or whatever. Maybe we can, we'll create you a playlist on the network and we'll put as much content up as possible. So keep that yeah, in mind. Yeah, I would love to. You know that I was talking to Tyler about that. Uh, most of the content I create right now, it's in Spanish. And he said, okay, let's start doing it in English. And that's what we're working on. And and, and, and that's what I want to do. This uh-huh. is this is my chance to do what I didn't do when, when I shoot that pilot for NBC. <laughs> yeah. Our approach is driven by identity. And when I say you're driven by identity, so if you look at, let's say you take Netflix, right? When you hear Netflix, you hear Netflix. Then you hear the show. Then you hear who's starring in the show. That's their marketing layout. So my thought is to speed up the process, let's make this thing driven by identity. I promote the talent first. Let's say, you know, Alfonso is on Bang Productions Television, right? Then the people who like Alfonso, oh, I love him. I'm going to go there. Then they find out what Alfonso is on, and then they did know what the network really is but the marketing would be the talent first it's kind of a backwards approach well it makes sense i mean that's what social media is it is really it's identity it is yeah why can't we duplicate that on the tv level i'm here ready to make big things with you cool cool well (laughs) well, i'm excited you got a great look i mean the you know the family the wife and what is the wife i didn't ask about what the wife does does she work with you or she work on something opposite or She's an artist. She paints. Okay, cool. And she's a great painter. I'll, I'll show you her artwork, but she 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 has an amazing an amazing talent. Nice. Does she try to exhibit some of her stuff? Or you know that she used to when uh, a few uh, a couple of years ago she used to do that, and she got tired of it because uh, all these galleries used to rip her and uh, get a lot of money, and uh, it was it, it was kind of frustrating for her, but she developed throughout the years um, a network of clients, and now what she does is that she works exclusively for those clients, so she creates all this series of uh, art pieces, and uh, before she finished them, they're already sold. Is there anything out there that your fans that may not know about you, that you do, that is something kind of a sidebar hobby or anything like that? Very few people that follows me as a talent know Mm -hmm. that I'm also a producer, (laughs) that I'm a content creator. They don't know that I'm behind everything I do. You're kind of like me. You do everything A to Z, huh? Yeah. (laughs) I'm a workaholic and I I like to have control over everything and working on, on for networks, I got used to just receive orders, but whenever I have a chance to take my own decisions, I do it. And I noticed a couple guys with you on the photo on your uh, Facebook page. Oh, yeah. Who that's, are those guys? That's a really cool project. That that happened because of coronavirus. One of the guys, his name is Hector, Mexico City. He used to be an executive for Univision. And mm-hmm. uh, after I left Univision, we kept our friendship. He, yeah. he became my friend. He passed from being my boss. He was he used to be the um, talent director for that network, and uh, we became friends. But he's also an artist. He's uh, he's always been in the music scene, and uh, he has worked and directed like huge uh, record um, uh, label companies. And when COVID came, we touched base, and I was like, "Hey, Hector, we should be doing something because we're stuck here." in our houses, doing nothing, going crazy. And we should talk to people and try to do something different. That We developed this new idea of Los Tres Mas, which is uh, three, the three plots. Mm-hmm. And the three plots, when, when we created this concept, I told him, listen, we need a comedian in our, in our show. So we brought the third guy, which is an Argentinian guy. His name is Diego Feingers. He's uh, from Argentina. And, uh, and, and he told me, like, this guy is going to be perfect for our show. So we brought him in. We started doing the show. We had really good chemistry. And we kept doing that show until December, every single night, Facebook Live. It Mm -hmm. didn't matter if there was 1 million people watching us and there were shows that we we had only 60 people watching. 
but we didn't wow. care. It was about the message that we were sending. We were having a good time. And that's how Los Tres Mas was, bor uh, was born. And now oh. um, we're trying to figure out what we can do with that show to bring it to a new level. We have not gone on air again since December because we're trying to like develop something that will not be the same thing. Because it was a cool project for the COVID-19 pandemic the, uh -huh. and, and being home and all that stuff. But now we were like, okay, what, what else can we do to make this really something bigger? Well, too, I know Tyler said, you know, if we put something on, up on the network to make it um, uh, English, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a playlist, a showcase list there with, with Spanish. With our network, we can market to anywhere in the world. I can send that promo or whatever to... Colombia to Mexico or whatever. I mean, eyeballs will still be monetized. So I don't know. Maybe we can look at both. We can look at English and Spanish. I don't have a problem with something being Spanish. Well, we could try it. Let's do it. How many episodes do you have? Started working on March 22nd and we did that show Monday through Friday for 30, 35 weeks. Wow. So uh, I would need to do the math, but we have a lot of shows, like a hundred shows. And you know what's the cool thing about the show? That we, we know a lot of people from the industry. So we had like really good guests in the show. Is it evergreen content or is it? Uh, some of them, not, not all of the shows. Because okay. we, we talk a lot about what's going on. But that's not a problem. I mean, we can, that's something we can work it out. Well, Alfonso, I, I mean, it was great talking to you. Is any other thing that uh, you want to put out there before we jump off here? I don't know how you found me. I think... Things happen for a reason, and I'm very excited about it. And uh, I'm looking forward to do amazing and really cool things with you. For your audience, which might not know what I do, I just if they have a chance and, and, and can check out my my social media and my outlets, my my platforms, it would be great. Awesome, looking man. forward to to do really cool things. Thanks, Alfonso. I'm glad you're on the team. Moving forward in the future, let's make the world a lot smaller. Put a learning voice out to the world. Let, let's go for it. And in Spanish, there, there's there's a saying, I don't know how to translate it into English, but we say like, okay, it's like break a leg. But yeah. in Spanish, you say mucha mierda, which is lots of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do lots of shit. <laughs> That's how we say it in, in Latin America. All right, cool. Well, this has been your Unimpressed Podcast. I'm John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bain Productions. <laughs> <laughs>